not. And then either we are going to be broadcast live or is this going to be us hens? It is live. Oh my God, it's live. Do you want to tag Ali Gonza in this video? Ali Gonza is my drag daughter. I named her. I gave her her last name. She came up with Ali. I'm like, what goes with Ali? I'm like, Ali Gonza. How, how perfect is that? And it's asking if I want to tag her in this video. So I am going to take that as a compliment. Anyway, hi, Facebook. We are here live. We are here with the Knoxville Farmed Animal Save doing something extra special. We are doing a live broadcast of my speech on pro-intersectional veganism. So I'm going to hand over the camera now to Sue. Here you go. And if the phone dies, the phone dies, but we'll see how much we get. So, and you got me? I've got you. Great. And do I look gorgeous? Of course. Okay, I feel gorgeous. So, <laughs> hello everyone. Welcome. My name is Honey LeBronx. I'm known as the Vegan Drag Queen, and you can find my cooking show at vegandragqueen.com and my podcast, Big Fat Vegan Radio, now in our 99th episode. And uh, find that anywhere. I don't know where you can find it, honestly. Find it anywhere podcasts <laughs> are findable. Um, <laughs> And you can also find me on all social media as at Honey LeBronx. End of story, I'm basically very easy to find, including on Patreon, where you can just happen to support my work while finding my work. So um, before I jump into the speech today, I do want to give a thank you to Sue Kinesia and Dan Warren Castillo and Knoxville Farm Animal Save. Thank you guys so much for bringing me out here and for having me, uh, for taking such wonderful care of me. They've already fed me, they've already chauffeured me across the state line and um, made sure that I have my Red Bull. So thanks for taking great care of me. And, um, and I want to start by just acknowledging a few trigger warnings. And actually, I want to give a trigger warning about trigger warnings. As essential as they are, I feel like we're getting to a point where they are starting to become a little overused. And I, I don't say that in a way where I um, begrudge them, but I think as useful and valuable and needed as they are, I would hate to see them overused to the point that people start to become desensitized and disregard them. With that said, I don't know where that line is yet. We'll have to cross it to look back and see where it was. So to cover all my bases, this speech will include a few topics that might be difficult for some people to hear about. Um, those topics include violence, racism, sexism, rape, ableism, transphobia, anti-Muslim bigotry, animal abuse, and a few others. So now that I've got that out of the way, um, I also want to especially thank you guys for having me here today because this day in history is my eighth year vegan anniversary. Wow. Wow. And when I looked back at that first day of being vegan, if you had told me that eight years from now I would be in Knoxville, Tennessee, <laughs> looking like dozens of dollars <laughs> giving this speech to you all, I and and a speech such as this, I, I would just be blown away. I would I would be so inspired back then to hear that I would one day get to do this. And so it's a real treat for me to get to do this with you guys. So let me just start by saying that the world, oh, let me also start by acknowledging that I have a script here because she is very long and it's ableist to expect a drag queen to memorize a speech. That's ableist because not everyone can memorize things. So the world as we inherited it is far from perfect. So exactly where and when, or where and how, do we begin to make it better? A wise person once said, if the oppressed are busy fighting each other, those in power win. In the 1960s in the United States, the civil rights movement was fighting for the rights of black people in America. They were faced with discrimination in voting, housing, and segregation laws. At the same time, women were fighting against discrimination in jobs, legal representation, and sexism in the media. And yet, the victories won by both women and black people were not benefiting everyone equally in those communities. The companies who started hiring more black workers were hiring black men, not black women. Companies who started hiring more women gave those jobs to white women, not black women. During the 60s and 70s, the idea of intersectionality began to arise out of the multiracial feminist movement who saw that black women in particular experienced increased discrimination because of both their gender and the color of their skin. 
This theory was pioneered largely by Kimberly Crenshaw, a professor at UCLA, who said that the experience of being a black woman cannot be understood in terms of being black and of being a woman considered independently, but must include the interactions which frequently reinforce each other. In the 1990s, as the theory began to gain prominence through the work of sociologist Patricia Hill Collins, she pointed out how cultural patterns of oppression are not only interrelated, but they're bound together and influenced by the intersectional systems of society, such as race, gender, class, and ethnicity. Collins referred to this as interlocking oppression. Today, this concept is expanding to include issues of ability, species, sexual orientation and expression, and it can be defined as the interconnected nature of social categorizations as they apply to a given individual or group, regarded as creating overlapping or interdependent systems of discrimination or dis disadvantage. Through an awareness of intersectionality, we can better acknowledge and ground the differences among us. So to understand oppression, we first need to understand privilege. What is it and how does it work? And so we're now going to delve into a bit of social justice history. We all have varying identities. I myself am white, I am gay, and although I'm a drag queen, I do identify as a cisgender male, which simply means that I am not transgender, which I know confuses a lot of straight people anyway. Uh, but rather, I identify with the gender that I was assigned at birth. Some aspects of my identity come with certain privileges, just as others come with certain disadvantages. Growing up gay, I can certainly identify with being a member of an oppressed minority. I know what it's like to be afraid of gym class for fear of being bullied in the locker room. I know the sting of not being able to bring my boyfriend to the high school prom, but don't worry, I had my best girlfriend invite my boyfriend to the prom, and then I went with some other girl, and then when we were on the inside, he and I got together. And I think eventually they got together too, so win-win. <laughs> so um, I know what it's like to not grow up seeing my people like me represented in the media, to grow up never seeing gay couples or same-sex affection shown on television in a positive way. I got the picture loud and clear as a kid that whatever I was, I wasn't normal. And I would have to hide who I was if I wanted to have a good life. Even when I had a boyfriend, I remember being afraid to hold his hand or give him a kiss in public for fear of what other people would do. I remember the bravery of holding hands with him while we were at the shopping mall. And then he let go of my hand when children passed by. <laughs> And when I asked him why he did this, he said, well, we shouldn't do that in front of kids. As if there's something so wrong or dirty or wicked about us that kids shouldn't have to see it. I wish I had seen that growing up. So despite the fact that I have known oppression, there's still many privileges that I have as a result of my identity. As a white person, I do not live in fear that the police may treat me unfairly because of the color of my skin. When I enter a shop, I'm not afraid that the storekeeper will watch me or follow me with suspicion. I'm not worried that my hair, the color of my skin, or the name that my parents gave me will ever prevent me from finding a good job. As a man, I seldom worry for my physical safety when I'm walking home alone at night, out of drag. And because I am male, I don't experience being interrupted when I have something to say or having to say the same thing five times in order to be heard and taken seriously, like women often experience. And as a cisgender male, I do not fear for my physical safety every time I need to use a public restroom, and I don't worry about being demonized by the media or otherized because of my gender or genitalia. People generally see me as someone who's trustworthy, respectable, and normal, knowing nothing about me. So many people who first hear about white privilege or male privilege, they often react harshly, saying that oppression of women and people of color isn't their fault, that they didn't ask to have these privileges, 
And some even flat out deny the existence of privilege because they say, well, they too had difficult lives and they didn't have it easy. Sure, there are many poor white people and there's many men performing hard manual labor and earning low wages. And even cisgender women still face plenty of oppression like earning less money than men or not being taken seriously when they report that they're the victim of a rape or domestic abuse. To be clear, acknowledging your privilege is simply an acknowledgement that you have certain benefits just because of the way you were born. These are benefits you can always rely on, even though you didn't do anything to earn them. And these are simply benefits that not everyone was born with. Now, of course, I enjoy the fact that people listen to me when I speak. I, but, and I, jo I enjoy that I don't live in fear of police brutality and that I can use a public restroom without fear. But the fact remains that everyone should enjoy these privileges. And acknowledging my privilege is simply my way of saying, yes, I see that I have these privileges. I see that not everyone else has them. And I, yes, I agree that they should have them, but they don't. So here's the good news about privilege. We can use our privilege to help make the world a better place. If you're white, you can use your voice to help amplify the voices and speak out for people of color. Because I'm generally listened to and respected by other white people, I can make a real difference by calling out other white people when they use language that perpetuates the oppression of people of color. If you're male, you can use your privilege to speak out for women. You can speak out against the ongoing epidemic of street harassment and violence towards women. And when your male friends disrespect women in public, you can tell them to knock it off and to consider how terrifying that would be if he were in her shoes. Because men generally listen to other men. And if you're human, you can use your voice to speak out for the animals. And if you're a drag queen, you can use the fact that everyone stops and stares and you've got their attention and you can use that to speak up for the animals. So you can use whatever talents and advantages you have to help amplify the voices of marginalized communities. By the way, could you guys just imagine coming out to your parents as intersectional? Like, Mom and Dad, please sit down. I have something to tell you. I'm intersectional. I've known for about like a year and a half now. And your parents are like, oh my God, what is it? And then you would tell them what intersectional means. And they'd be like, oh my God, it's even worse than we thought. <laughs> so when I was preparing to give this speech, I was reading this book um, on how to give a speech. And the first several chapters dealt with like, where are you going to be speaking? What time of day will it be? Is the audience going to be mostly men or mostly women? What will their age demographic be? It even said things like, will they just have eaten? Will they probably be ready to take a nap? Are you going to be the last thing they need to deal with before it's time for them to go to dinner? And literally, I stopped reading the book because I didn't care about any of that. I was like, I don't care how old the audience is. I don't care if I'm speaking to men or women. Just where's the part of this book that tells me exactly what to say and how to say it? A while ago, I was talking with a new friend who isn't vegan, and yes, that's a euphemism. But anyway, after we were done, we were hanging out and talking, and he didn't really seem interested in becoming vegan himself, but he did want to know why I became vegan. I spoke so eloquently for like 20 <laughs> minutes and I included every argument other than animal suffering. I talked about the environment and immigrant labor and health and I spoke so brilliantly about veganism. But I mean there's a lot of reasons to go vegan obviously but we all know the most important reason right? At least we know Say it with me. The most important reason to go vegan is Animals. to Animals. piss people off. <laughs> I mean, if, you have, if you have to stay vegan for one reason, for me, that's what keeps me vegan. Because even if I'm not in it for the animals anymore, I'm still in it to piss people off. Because doesn't that. it just F with people? Like, you simply mention that you're vegan and someone gets defensive. Like, oh, well, you know, not everyone, not everyone has a Whole Foods in their area. That's, that's um, classist to think that you have to all... Girl, I'm talking about me. I'm just talking about me. So I gave this guy such a 
brilliant explanation of veganism that I thought, there is no way he's getting out of this room alive. He is leaving here a vegan. And when I was done, he basically said, yeah, well, that's good for you. And I was appalled. I thought, how could such a brilliant impromptu speech not have made a difference for this guy? And then I realized I wasn't interested in finding anything out about him. I wasn't interested in where he's coming from. And it turns out this guy hasn't spoken to his family in years because when he came out as gay, his family told him that they hope he dies of AIDS. This is someone who's actually dealing with something and is struggling with other social just justice issues already. I, I, in my little speech, I didn't take any of that into account. I just wanted to say these magic words and like make him vegan. And, and if only it were that easy, but here's the thing. Everyone you ever meet is gonna know something that you don't. So don't rob yourself of that. Get curious, get curiously engaged in what is this person here to teach me? So I didn't see that I had anything to learn from this guy. I was the expert, he was there to listen, and that was that. But the best way to make a difference for another person is to first get related to them, find out what are they interested in, what are they dealing with, and what do they really care about. If I want to talk to a group of people about why they should go vegan, I also need to understand that some of the people listening might have other struggles that they're dealing with. To be clear, animal liberation is still the issue that's most important to me, perhaps because I'm fighting for the lives of 150 billion land animals who are killed every year according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. But animal rights isn't the only cause that needs attention. And it certainly isn't all that I'm capable of caring about. If we aren't checking in with other social justice movements and with other individuals who experience oppression, then we really do give the appearance, the appearance of being selfish. We care about our cause, but we refuse to care about any cause other than, my, other, our, than our own. So what are some things that other people are dealing with that I might not experience myself? Today, there is still nowhere in the world where women are considered equal to men. Anywhere. All over the world, women still fear for their safety. They still get interrupted by mansplainers who think that they know better than women. They still live in, high fear, in fear of the high likelihood of being raped, and they fear reporting their rape to the police for fear of not being taken seriously, or worse, being blamed for their own rape. In many parts of the world, women are still being denied the right to their own sexual health and reproductive rights. All around the world, people from a war-torn country are seeking refuge for their families in countries that demonize and shun them. Syrian refugees have become the subject of much debate, and they're made to feel unwanted when all they're trying to do is what anyone in this room would also do for their families if they had to. Most countries still have laws discriminating against same-sex relationships, and in many countries, you can still be put to death for being a homosexual. In 2015 in Uganda, they secretly tried to hold a pride celebration, and it was promptly raided by police. People were beaten, jailed, and publicly shamed. Some even tried to escape by jumping from a window on the fourth floor of a building. Because the fear of being publicly exposed as homosexual in Uganda is scarier than jumping from the fourth floor of a building. And meanwhile, the president publicly stated that if these people were to be attacked by an angry mob, they would have brought it on themselves. In Russia, activists have tried organizing pride parades for years only to be beaten and arrested. Russia then passed an anti-gay propaganda law making it illegal to assemble, protest, or even speak well of homosexuality. Meanwhile, in Chechnya, over 200 gay and bisexual men have been rounded up and detained in actual concentration camps, where they are currently being tortured, some even killed. And the leader of Chechnya has vowed to purge all homosexuals from the country. And families are told that if they don't kill their gay or bisexual family members, the government will. Very recently, a 17-year-old boy was pushed off the ninth floor balcony by his uncle when he discovered his nephew was gay. Mercy killings such as these are becoming commonplace throughout Chechnya, and they're referred to as cleaning your honor with blood. 
And here in the United States, we refused visas to 40 men trying to escape Chechnya, where there, and the current administration here has not so much as commented on the situation in Chechnya. So most Americans don't actually know that this is happening. Now I could go on and on about the plights of individuals from all other marginalized communities, but I guess you're starting to see for yourself how lucky you are if none of those things apply to you. And you're starting to see, you know, the animal rights activists who would proudly say that they only care about animals, as if that's something to be proud of, this diminishes our ability to make a difference in the world. Here we are actually believing that we only have enough compassion and enough power to make a difference in one area. For someone as evolved and aware and passionate as a vegan to think that they can only make a difference for animals, it's incredibly short-sighted. In fact, I feel it will be hard-pressed, I get hard-pressed to think of a community who feels as deeply or who thinks as rationally and who fights for, so, for justice as tirely, tirelessly as the animal rights community. Now imagine how big a difference we could make in the world if a group this powerful were to take a stand for women, if for the elderly, for people of color, we have to remember that not only is our own community comprised of all different types of people, but our target audience will most likely fall into one of those categories as well. And no matter how brilliantly you speak, no matter how great your talking points are, no matter how convincing your argument is, believe me when I say, the person that you're talking to will be thinking in the back of their head, but what about me? What about my struggle? Are you my ally or are you just preaching to bring me over to your side? If we're going to make allies, and if it were just to say, if we're going to make new vegans, which is our only option at this point, because let's face it, you can only go vegan once, right? It's, that's like the one thing I can't stand about being vegan is I can't keep doing it. <laughs> but we have to find out what's important to them and how we can make a difference for them. Because when they ask you, well, what about police brutality and or if they ask you, like, what about Trump, you know, threatening to ban all Muslims from coming into the country? And you can't genuinely show that you share their concerns and you're willing to stand with them. Then what gets revealed are the things that you don't have to worry about on a day-to-day -day basis. But your target audience has to think about these things every day in addition to worrying about animals. They don't have the luxury of only caring about animals. So here's the good news. I know that I'm going to see animal liberation in my lifetime. I know that. But we're only going to get there if we all get there as one. This idea that, well, first we're going to fight for people of color, then the gays, <laughs> if there's enough time, the trans community, <laughs> this will always put the animals last. Until people can connect the dots and see all suffering as equal, animal suffering will always be the lowest priority on the fight, in the fight for social justice. We can't defeat speciesism while contributing to another system of oppression. By seeing all oppression as connected, we avoid ranking some forms as more important than others. It's fine to have one cause as a main focus, and it's great if you can even support other social justice movements and build bridges with them and help amplify the marginalized voices, but you don't even have to do those things. In fact, sometimes when you don't know how you can help, the best thing to do is nothing. But the bottom line here is to educate yourself so that you can stop contributing to other forms of oppression. That's the main cause the main goal, rather, of the pro-intersectional movement. Anything you can do above and beyond that is just icing on the cake. Now, of all the theories about a pro-intersectional approach to social justice, 99% of them do not include animal rights in their vision. And as an animal rights movement, we can't succeed without involving other communities. When I first heard about intersectionality, I thought I'd finally found like the secret way to make other people go vegan by guilt. Like if I'm talking to women or I'm talking to other gay people, like I can tell them, like, well, uh, you're a hypocrite if you aren't vegan for the animals because you're contributing to the same systems of oppression that are oppressing you. 
I thought I discovered the secret to making everyone wake up to the fact that nothing but ethical veganism makes sense. Now, however noble my intentions were at the time, I can now look back and laugh at how naive I was. I can see how my privilege made it possible for me to ignore their identities and to tell them what they should be fighting for. Now, as a cisgender white male, I now recognize, finally, I don't get to tell black people what to do. I just, I don't. I don't get to tell women how they should feel about their circumstances. I don't. And I don't get to pretend that I understand everyone in the LGBTQIA plus community, because I don't. And I definitely don't get to tell people, people who are fighting for things that I'll never have to fight, what they should care about. Intersectionality originally came from black feminism, and even in giving this speech, I must always remember and acknowledge that I am a white man taking something from black women and using it for purposes they never intended. So I must always be careful to listen and make space for others. I can never assume that my point of view will work for everyone. All I can do is work to make the animal rights community as safe and inclusive and welcoming as possible while continuing to convey the urgency of joining our movement. Creating safe spaces is key to making others a part of our community. For example, we can create ground rules for our community by saying that sexist or racist or ageist behavior will not be tolerated when we're at a protest. For example, in Brooklyn, New York, there's an annual protest against a religious religious animal sacrifice involving chickens. And all too often, very well-meaning animal rights protesters will resort to using language that is violently anti-Semitic just because their feelings got the better of them. This not only makes them uncomfortable, it makes us uncomfortable. And there's also methods of activism that use tactics or imagery that objectifies women using nudity to get attention and still others that resort to fat shaming to try to sell people on the health benefits of a vegan diet. And meanwhile, there are people, both vegans and non-vegans, who feel objectified by this kind of imagery. Advocates of this type of approach will argue that it gets attention and any press is good press, and that we can leverage people's vanity and sexuality to sell them on veganism, but at what cost? In America, the feminism movement focuses mostly on white women in the mainstream. And so there's much debate in feminism about feminism versus white feminism. All of this keeps oppressed people fighting each other instead of uniting to fight together for their common goal. Intersectionality is a new set of tools that we can use to craft our message in a way that maximizes our effectiveness without alienating others or supporting the systems that oppress them. When you say that you only care about animals, what you're saying is that you're opposed to rape or murder or torture unless the innocent victim is human. If you wouldn't say you don't care about women or you don't care about people of color or you don't care about people living with disabilities, then you have to realize that that is what you're saying if you say, I only care about animals. A friend of mine once said on Facebook that she thinks it's great that I'm vegan, but she'd rather focus on making the world a better place for people. As if those things are mutually exclusive. You can't have compassion for this guy over here and then deny your compassion for this guy over there because that's not compassion. That's what we call favoritism. So what is it that makes it easier for us to be kind to animals and still disregard other people? Because even non-vegans can become outraged at the idea of animal abuse. But we can stay so silent on the abuse of people, it's as if we just can't hold that much compassion in our hearts. Now, it's not uncommon for our first reaction when confronted by a form of suffering or oppression that we aren't familiar with. Our first gut reaction is often that, oh, that's too much for me to handle. I can't possibly... That's more than I can possibly care about. I can't make a difference there. I, I can't possibly care about everything that I care about and that. Someone else is going to have to take that on. Let those people fight for that cause by themselves. 
what we end up doing is we take our heart away and we love a little less. I like to say, compassion is a muscle and it gets bigger the more that we exercise and examine it. The more that we flex the muscle of compassion, the bigger and stronger our hearts get. And so when we find ourselves considering, oh, I can't take that on, that's too much for me to handle, what we can do is we can catch that thought. Now, you aren't responsible for the first thought that pops in your head. The first thought that comes to you that was put there by your, that was pre-programmed by the way that you were taught by the world to think and to feel and react. But we can hear that first thought and we can choose what comes next. So let's keep it in the front of our minds that whenever we think our heart isn't big enough, what we can do is we can, we can love harder. We can try hard. We can, we can try, we, when we think that we can't possibly care about more things, we can try to love a little stronger. And what would that look like? I have no answer for that. That's literally something that each of us gets to discover for ourselves. What would my life look like if I could love harder than I already do? And what would that make available in my life, in my activism for the animals? I believe we can have a world that works for everybody. The intersectionality movement gets people to consider what it's like for other people. Now, if you're a black cisgender male, it might be your first time considering that the struggle for people of color is much different for women in your own movement. And, you can, and, and when you can empathize with that, you get to consider what it must be like for them. You get to consider what are they doing and dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis to fight for their own rights. Fighting not only to not be brutalized by police, but then on their walk home that night, fighting to not be sexually harassed. And at the heart of considering what it's like for someone else is identification. And if I can get that a woman faces different challenges than I do, then I can empathize with her struggle. I can try it on for myself and I can imagine what that would be like for me. And once I can do that, an action shows up that I can take called, I can care. I can take the action called, advocate for women. I can take the action called, be an ally and ask, how can I help? The beauty of the pro-intersectionality movement is that it gets people who can identify with their own suffering and struggle for social justice to empathize with and consider the pain and suffering of another. Now, by a show of hands here, who has ever just wished that non-vegans would just be open to criticism? <laughs> That's like pretty much everyone here, right? Okay. Who hasn't just thought at one point or another like, God, I wish that these meat eaters could just listen with an open mind and just consider what I'm saying. Yes, you Facebook. Every damn day. And I wish that you could just, like, just consider it. I'm not saying you have to go vegan today, but like, God, just, you don't have to make any life altering changes, but just please let me contribute to you. Let me offer you a perspective other than your own so you can see what that might make available and just try on that question for yourself. By the way, is anyone here who's not vegan? Okay, not that we judge, because we don't judge, right? Vegans don't judge, we just love really, really hard. <laughs> but seriously, now again, raise your hand if you're vegan, and I'll keep your hand up if someone's ever said, ever accused you of caring more about animals than you care about people. You'll notice all of the hands are still up, right? Now here's the thing. Don't they wish that we were just open to their criticism? Don't they wish we would stop and consider their question? Don't they wish we would at least try on their idea? Maybe let in their criticism before we immediately negate them and tell them how stupid they are. If we believe in what we believe in, then anyone should be able to say anything to us about our veganism. We should be able to be with anything that they have to say about us or how we advocate for the animals without us having to make them wrong or telling them that the way they see it isn't the way it is and they just don't get it. But here's the thing. If we want them to consider our point of view, maybe we can be the example of how to do that. I think that we can all agree with the phrase, be the change that we want to see in the world. So the next time someone says, you care more about animals and you care about people, we can consider one, 
is that true? Two, why is that person saying this? And three, what might I be doing? Or what might my animal rights community be doing to give that impression? To simply tell them that they're wrong and invalidate their point of view is not going to move them. They're just going to walk away from that encounter even more certain that they're right and we're wrong and that we're that one of those vegans, right? But at the end of the day, we still want the same thing. We both want peace on the planet in our lifetime and a world that works for everyone. So in what ways might we be giving the impression that we care more about animals than we do about humans? Well, when I scroll through my friend's Facebook activity, I often see no comment on police brutality or police killing black people in America. I see no outrage, no anger, no suggestions for how we can do better. I just see post after post after post about animal issues. And yeah, I can imagine how that might look to someone who's not vegan. I can even imagine how that might look to someone who's just looking for evidence to support their claim that you can't possibly care about animals and care about people at the same time. So what I can do instead as a pro-intersectional animal rights activist is to realize when it's time to speak out for animals and when other concerns deserve my attention. For example, I post a lot of stuff on Facebook about animals, but the day after the mass shooting in Las Vegas is probably not the best day for me to post some undercover video displaying graphic footage of pig slaughter. And when two white police officers, each with a history of using excessive force, went free after fatally shooting Alton B. Sterling, an innocent man who did not commit a crime, that might not be the best time to post this long rant about why everyone needs to stop eating animals. I always used to think, oh, I can't be sexist because I'm gay. Like, it, like it's magic. Like, automatically, I just can't be sexist. And then one day, I asked myself, what if I'm sexist and I don't know it? And in the days and weeks that followed, I started to discover all these opportunities to uncover and address my own sexist thoughts and belief. And this made it possible for me to become a feminist ally. Pro-intersectionality gives us a framework inside which we can all live in the solution to oppression and social injustice. This movement consists of leaders, people who are primed and ready to consider what it's like for someone else who experiences oppression. And these are exactly the people who we need to reach out to and invite them to consider what it's like for the animals. To consider not just what it's like for the animals, as if it's another cause to sign up for, or another drain of their time and energy, but to enroll them in the idea, in the possibility of granting somebody else freedom from suffering, torture, oppression, just by making a different choice three times a day. How wonderful that they don't need to do anything other than what they're already doing to make a difference. Now, how many social justice movements do you know in which they can make a real difference just by simply ordering their food or clothing or entertainment a little differently? Currently, much of the pro-intersectionality movement ignores the idea that there are other individuals suffering who need their suffering acknowledged, who need advocating. But because the intersectionality movement is already in this inquiry, because they're already asking themselves these difficult and inconvenient questions and challenging their own views, pro-intersectionality is not only an idea for vegans to take on for the purpose of being more effective, but the intersectionality movement itself, as I see it, is our greatest ally to date. Our greatest allies are the people who are already making those connections between all other forms of oppression. We're not only asking them to consider what it's like for animals, but also to consider the intersections within the animal agriculture system and how it equally oppresses animals and undocumented immigrants and people of color and how it violates human rights. So if we want to build the animal rights movement, we would do best to build bridges with people fighting for other social justice issues. Now here's the thing, it's okay to make mistakes. 
you are all going to make mistakes. I'm, even after this speech, I'm going to give, to make mistakes. I might watch the Facebook Live feed of this and see all sorts of comments where someone's like, how could you have said that? That is terribly offensive, or that oppresses these people. And I will have an opportunity to thank someone for pointing that out to me. I'll have the opportunity to take their comments to heart. I'll have the opportunity to thank them for contributing to me and to ask what I can do to be a better ally for other marginalized communities. That's how I plan to continue learning and growing in wisdom and compassion. Because this is about progress, not perfection. And so as long as we can strive to be a little better every day, I know that in our lifetimes, we can dismantle racism, classism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, and yes, speciesism. And we will have a world that works for everybody. Thank you. Aww. Did you get that whole thing on Facebook Live? Oh my god! I was like, I don't want to rush this, but I know that I gotta be efficient with time. Do we have how, lots of love? Uh, is it still going? It's still going. It's still going. <laughs> so, um, how much battery do I have left at this point? Uh, it gave me a twenty percent warning about two minutes we ago. We made it. You know what? We made it through the wilderness. <laughs> Somehow, we made it through. I didn't know how lost I was until <laughs> until I found you. Uh, uh, those are Madonna lyrics. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> great. So normally, um, I love to do a little um, a little kiki with uh, the people afterwards and just take time for questions or a little Oprah after the show moment. Um, so does anyone have questions or comments? I'm looking at her. <laughs> it's kind she, of like, she, she almost always has questions. Almost, it's kind of like the first hors d'oeuvre at the cocktail party. Like, no one wants, wants to be the first one to, the tray. to jump in. Um, so I thought it was great. Oh, thank you. I really appreciated some uh, uh, thinking about it, you know, less selfishly, and you know, we can get so single focused, and uh, we all have families who are, don't understand us, and we kind of tend to stay away from them because we just can't be around them because they don't get why we're vegans or yeah. our, our cause. But you're right. If we can't just stay away from them, we need to be with them more. <laughs> I love that you say that. I this thought came to me today while I was doing my makeup. Not that I wear makeup. I know that some people choose to, and that of course is their so right. Natural, yeah. But um, while I was pinching my cheeks and putting a little bit of clear mascara on my natural lashes, <laughs> what's funny? Um, I was I was doing a sort of meditation because. Well, my sponsor might later watch this and be like, what do you mean you didn't meditate the minute you woke up? So I was like, God, please let this makeup app process serve as my meditation. And I put on some like frequency megahertz meditation thing on Spotify to like make it count. And this thought came to me. I just kept hearing, there is no enemy. There is no enemy. Now, I, I don't know if that's wisdom or whatever, but like that's what came to me. That's like the little fortune cookie message God chose to put in my tummy this morning. And I tried that on and I started thinking about it. And it's like, well, I accept that as true, but I certainly don't live my life that way on the court. Like, oh, the app, you, what do you mean there's no enemy? There's, you know, well, like, what about Republicans? Like, Republicans aren't the enemy. Like, they're us. I won't say Republicans are messing things up right now for all of us and for themselves. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that they're the enemy. Like, there is, okay, so if the enemy isn't here, where is the enemy is over there, right? Where is the enemy over there? Is it Kim Jong un? There is no enemy. Now, I could make the argument that the only enemy is within, and maybe that's it. The enemy is the voices that woke up, the, the voices that were in my head, and when I woke up, they said, oh, good, I'm glad you're awake. I couldn't wait to talk to you, right? But there is no enemy, and yet often I will find myself listening to Citizen Radio, one of my favorite podcasts. Anyone here? Citizen Radio? Okay. You're welcome, by the way. <laughs> Citizen Radio. And uh, it's a political podcast that talks about stories that the mainstream media just does not pay attention to. And I will listen to political news, and I listen to it from the point of view of like, okay, 
Christmas dinner with the family, when politics come up, this is all the ammo that I'm going to use. I'm going to be so <laughs> right, and I'm going to win the arguments. And so that is the approach. And I, look, I, I can't speak for everyone, just myself, but I know that there's a big component in our movement of being right. Like a great question, I've done a lot of coaching, and both as a coach and being coached, and one of the greatest questions I've ever asked is, what are you, what are you being right about right now? And I can check in with myself in the middle of an argument and ask, am I being right about something? Like not being right like a statistic, but like, or being factually right about something, but like being right as a way of being. Like, oh, you know how I'm being right now? You know, I wouldn't even call it stubborn. I would just call it, I'm being right. That's how I'm being. And if that's my way of being, if that's the way of being that's giving me who I am in the moment, I'm not gonna make a difference for anyone. And at the end of the day, do I want to make a difference for someone who's not like me? Well, you bet. Like, I really don't care to make a difference for, for the vegans. Like, you're the popcorn that's already popped. I was talking to Dan on the drive uh, here this morning, and he was saying how he's been vegan for, a, is it a year and a half? And I was like so grateful to hear that you haven't been vegan longer than me. It's like, I'm, like, I'm not interested in all these vegans who were vegan before. I, I want to know, like, who went vegan after me? Like, I want to know that it's working. I want to know that we're getting the job done. And so I think in each um, of those situations where we're talking to, like, the other, the enemy, family, Republicans, um, people who watch Fox News, I think the best thing that we can do is be like, this is my teacher. My teacher is showing up in this moment, in this form. My teacher, God is choosing this form right now in front of me. You know, like, let's have the same compassion for this person if I were... Let's have the same compassion for this person as I would if they were a piglet. Because yeah. I would fight for them no harder. Because, you know, a lot of those little chickens, we roll up our sleeves and save them. If this was Cinderella and they took human form, they might watch Fox News. Yeah. You know? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that got me going. That really got me going. <laughs> Anyone else? I could relay some other questions that I've been given um, recently, but um, someone recently asked me, he was, say, he, he, this was in Atlanta yesterday, and he raised his hand, and he's like, not in so many words, but he was talking about how so often in the animal rights movement, he sees the opposite of what I spoke about today, showing up in our behavior. And he's like, uh, and, and this was a person of color, I, uh, I, I didn't ask which, but um, this is a non-white person, and he's, he boiled it down, he's like, you know, at the end of the day, like, the problem is kind of white people. And I'm like, that is a hard communication to be with, <laughs> especially on stage, in front, of a, in, in front of an audience. But like, when I kind of boiled it down to it, uh, you know, and again, there is no enemy. And I thought, well, is, are, are we the problem? Like, I'm not all white people, but are we the problem? And I thought, I don't know if it's that we are the problem. I think it's that, you know, I say that I'm committed to a world that works for everyone. And what we have right now is a world that does work very, very well for white people. It works really well for us. Like, I'm not going to lie. It's really nice. It, you know, things work. I get respected. I get what I want. Um... And I don't think white people really realize that that's not the world everyone has. You know, yeah. my, um, my, my old roommate, my, I, I, I hate, I literally, I hate saying this, my best friend is black, but like literally he is. My ex-roommate, Bob the Drag Queen, um, he's my drag mother and the winner of season eight of RuPaul's Drag Race, no big deal, but wow. you knew that. Wow. So one day we were outside of the store and we came out of the shop and I realized I, I forgot something that I went in there to get. And so we each have, you're picturing her in drag in this story, aren't you? You're picturing like up to, okay, <laughs> keep it, keep it. Um, and so I'm like, oh, I forgot, I don't know, raisinets or something, whatever. Though I don't, they're probably not vegan. So I forgot something, like a soda. And so I'm like, oh, I forgot to get my soda. I'm going to go in and, and he's like, okay, I'll wait out here. And I'm like, well, come, come on in with me. He's like, no, I'll, I'll wait out here. And I'm like, well, just stop being stubborn, come in. And I'm like, why is he doing, he's always doing stupid stuff like this. He's like, I can't go in. I'm like, why not? He's like, they'll think I stole something. I'm like, no, they won't. And he's like, I have a bag in my hand. If I go back in after leaving, they will think I'm stealing. 
And my first reaction was to tell him, like, don't play Volk, stop that. And I'm like, oh my God. That was like one of the first, like, until I lived with a black person and got to see his life on a day to day, I was like, it was eye opening. That sounds so like something a white person would say. Like, I just came back from Michigan and wow, it was enlightening. But, like, it was really an opportunity. Like, we occupy the same apartment and yet we live in two different worlds. And, and I thought, oh, if that were me, oh, hell no, I would go in there. And I would be like, how dare. And I'm like, nope, maybe I wouldn't. Maybe I would be like, nope, this is going to happen at least 12 times today. And if I can minimize it and get it down to three, that would be a great day. And I just do not feel like wasting my energy on this one. Because that means I'm going to pop off on the 10th person. So that's something I think white people need to learn to understand. I don't think we do enough considering what the, what the world we've created is like for people who are not us. And I think one of the big problems with that is our history. I'm dating someone right now. I'm so happy to say that. <laughs> I'm dating someone now from, um, she lives in, uh, I'm just kidding. Could you imagine? <laughs> he, uh, he lives in, uh, always keep him guessing. Um, he lives in um, the, the Netherlands. And one of the things that we are fascinated to find out about each other's cultures is like, what are they teaching in your history books? Because ours are like totally whitewashed and blah, blah, blah. Not, he's not saying that. He actually got a much better account of our own history than we did. And mm -hmm. I'll give one example. Slavery in the United States is so, oh, it's so, you should read it. It's such a beautiful story. It's like, we used to make these people work and we didn't pay them, but we did give them food and shelter, but we just didn't pay them. So it wasn't on the up and up really. And sometimes when they got out of line, you know, we let our feelings get the best of us and sometimes we hit them. But a lot of people hit people in those days. You know, women got hit too. And I, that's, that's really what my understanding of slavery growing up. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Like I wasn't like wrapped with attention in history class. Maybe now I understand why, but um, I really think one of the problems is that like white people are writing the history books. And I used to just think that that's just, that's just coincidence. That's just happenstance. But like, I'm starting to think that that is a, a bit more sinister, that that's how it's happening. And I do think that other people need to be put in charge of writing our history because we don't know what happened here. And I think if we can start to understand our own history in this country, uh, I mean, like, for example, I, I wrote a um, parody song to the tune of White Christmas. Um, I love that. It by goes. The way. Have you seen it? Yes. <laughs> I benefit privilege. from white privilege. <laughs> I've never been three fifths a man, um, and uh, or with every taxi cab I hail, and uh, really just brilliant, brilliant lyrics. But I wasn't going to write this song like half-assed. I thought I need to make it my business to understand this history before I can write the song. In fact, I waited a whole year to write it because I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to spend some time doing my research. The first time I saw a diagram of a slave ship, it blew my mind. I'd never been shown that before. When I saw that there is a diagram for how they lay them, like head to toe, toe to head, like they packed them in like cargo. Mm -hmm. And there was no charge for the humans. There was only a charge for the shipping. So it doesn't matter how many you pack in. Well, half of them will die in transit. So pack in as many as you can. Because it doesn't matter. We, we want to get as many over there as we can. So if they die, it's fine. And when I read the conditions that they were brought over here in, I mean, like, and if you were lucky enough to survive that, guess what? You get to become a slave. And if you were lucky enough to survive that, guess what? You have the peace of mind of knowing that your great, great, great grandchildren are going to be denied housing and turned away yeah. for jobs. And, and you know what I often hear to counter that? Well, their own people sold them into it. Yeah, well, there's uh, a supply and a demand. So yeah. who, who was demanding and who was paying for it? Exactly. Them? Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that, I, yeah, I, I think it's probably a good place to end it right there so that we get all of it <laughs> on, uh, on there. But thank you guys so much Can for... Can you tell us about your show when you do... Yes, I'm doing a show tomorrow as a fundraiser for the Knoxville Farm to Animal Save. It's going to be at Club XYZ. Club LMNLP was busy, so. <laughs> uh, 
So it's going to be Club XYZ tomorrow night. Um, I think door opens at like 7.30 and then we're going to start the show at, no, 7 and then the show's at 7.30. Yes. Which, let's be real, drag time means I'll probably show up around 9 o'clock and ask how it was. <laughs> uh, but please come out and um, there will be a suggested donation at the door. It's all a fundraiser for Not So Farm Animal Save. And, um, and please tip generously because that's how we're going to raise some money. And you will see me do a fierce step touch and um, do a lot of drag numbers and say a lot of awful, horrible things, which will seem in the moment to contradict everything that my speech is about. <laughs> but listen, that is my job. I am here to inject some levity and humor back into the drag community because the thing that causes activists to burn out is just having no sense of humor and taking things too seriously, and then it's just not fun anymore. So. We've got to be able to laugh at it. We've got to be able to laugh at ourselves while we are in the face of horrible, horrible things. And um, I think that's what's going to keep us going in the end. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my God. This is like the oil that burned for eight days. I'm so happy. <laughs> Yay. Oh, gosh. Very nice. Right. Let's Should see. I just hand it to you? Yes. Oh. Bam. Bam, bam, bam. Oh my god, I can't believe!